if you compare the budgets that would go to the pop department, the pop department would get a 300 train load of goodies. Go make it happen. Urban department would get a book of matches <laughs> and say, now use each match to make it hot. Make it hot. So disproportionately, the budgets were not right. How did you start in the record business? Sweeping a record shop. Did you really? When I was 11 years old, and it was in Los Angeles on Hobart and Santa Barbara, which is now Martin Luther King. The record shop was called Jeff's Records, but Jeff Thomas Jr. was actually one of the original Little Rock Nine. In high school, they were having music during lunchtime, so this guy by the name of Bill Wiley was playing music. Well, he's playing the song that everyone knows uh, I want to make it with you the whispers has made it bread made it and at that time there was an artist from New York named Ralphie Pagan right and Ralphie had it but the beginning of Ralphie's version had a very distinctive guitar lick and Bill said on over the PA system you know this sounds like Buddy Miles down by the river I shot my baby which is a Neil Young song and I happened to have it so I actually went up to the office and I said oh I got that song he said, well, why don't you bring it in? And I started bringing in records. And he said to me, look, can you do this for me? And I'm in the 10th grade, fresh, right at Dorsey High School here in Los Angeles. He said, look, I am part of the senior government football team, and I'm the DJ too. And he says, the only time I have to see my girlfriend is during lunch. And I'd rather hang out with her than do this. Do you mind doing this? I said, okay, sure. And that's that's how that started. I was a the lunchtime DJ in 1971 in the 10th grade at Dorsey. Oh my God! <laughs> and so in 1973, 11th grade, I was at Jeff's Records and I met this gentleman. He was a merchandiser. He had just quit Mattel Toys and his name is Gerald Busby. So at Jeff's Records, I told Gerald that I play music at lunchtime. He says, well, can I come by? And he came by, and he was impressed that all these kids were sitting out on the lawn, the courtyards, and enjoying their lunch, enjoying the music that I was playing. So we had a really great connection. And then by the 12th grade, Gerald started giving me boxes of records to give away at lunchtime. And I had like a 45-minute lunch there. And it was amazing because they had a lot of excess merchandise and records from the Watt Stacks Festival in 1972, I think it was 73, that they did at the Coliseum, which had 100,000 people. Gerald started bringing artists to the school to perform at lunchtime. The student government tried to intervene and said, well, we can make some money off this and let's charge the kids. And I said, no, we're gonna, this is open for everybody and we're going to do it for free. And it just really worked out beautifully. And then Gerald thought up of an idea, having a weekend little segment on a local station here in LA, 1580 K-Day, for high school kids to do a little hour show. And I was on there a couple times, but it worked out better at KAGB, which was owned by Clarence Avant. I ended up being on the radio in the 12th grade in high school. I was doing a Saturday morning show. I think I did like two hours but it was amazing and I had a great time. Back then, FM radio was kind of like our friend Frankie Crocker. Mm -hmm. Mellow, smooth, they're kind of like people that are here in LA, the wave. Right. You know? So here it is, this kid, instead of saying, how you doing, everything's cool, baby. I was screaming and yelling on FM radio, which was like, oh my God, that's what the guys do on AM. So there happened to be this guy by the name of Skip Miller who was the regional guy for, Western regional guy for Motown at the time. At that time, the radio station was on La Cienega and Century. So as you're exiting the Los Angeles airport, you gotta drive by there. He had just come off a plane, he heard me on the radio, he stopped by and he said to me, I just wanted to meet you. I said, oh great, it's nice to meet you. <laughs> I didn't know, you know, and he said, look, what do you want to do with your career? Do you want to have a career in radio where you uh, go all the way, become a music director, program director? The whole I said, Skip, look, I'm just having fun. I don't know. He said, I like that answer. Right out of high school, I created my own company and I emulated my lunchtime show 
called the High School Radio Network. So in 1974, when I graduated, I started that, and Motown was my very first client. I'm at my mother's house, and I realized that I had 22 record companies paying me $150 a week to distribute and promote records in the high schools, but I got 60 high schools. I convinced them to have a noontime program. Wow. And so the kids would only play the songs I... I brought, yes, yeah. that you brought them, yes. Yeah. So that was very unique, and actually Miller London in 1979 had Jean Williams, I think. She was at Billboard, and she did an article on me, and boy, that 22 turned into like 50. And it was great. It was just phenomenal, and then... Gerald Busby at that time had moved from Stax to Casablanca and he cut a deal with me that was really great because he says, look, during the summer you got no money coming in. How about if we put you on retainer at $100 a week so at least you got $100 a week coming in during the summer and it's like a $5,200 deal. I said, I'll take it. <laughs> I'll take it. It's great. Why not? That's how that connection happened. It was really magical. And then fast forward to 1980, I realized that every time I go up to Motown, I, I saw that they had done some layoffs and they let go of the Western Regional Promotion guy. Mm. That vacancy was there for a year. But I said, hey, Skip, uh, that job is... Uh, it's not filled. I, I was wondering if I can have that job. And so I think about it, he says, I don't see anything wrong with that. <laughs> so they hired three of us in the most important markets. They hired me in uh, the Western region from Denver to the Pacific Ocean, Eddie George in New York, mm -hmm. and uh, James Cochran in Chicago, all at the same time to be regionals. It was just magical. So when I was at Motown, it was just the right place at the right time. And what defines that? The fact that they had hit songs. Mm. Who were some of the artists that you broke during that time at Motown? Rick James. He had his biggest album, Street Songs, with Give It To Me Baby, Super Freak. And then Tina Marie had Square Biz, I Need Your Love. And I had worked all those songs. Uh, Smokey Robinson had Being With You. Jermaine Jackson had Let's Get Serious. And then he had uh, uh, You Like Me, Don't You. And then Let Me Tickle Your Fancy. Worked all those songs. Actually, it was interesting. I was the Western Regional guy. And I've always had a really great relationship with the artists, but I learned all that from Gerald Busby. Because when I met Gerald in, when I was in high school, just to digress a little bit, I was like enamored by him. I just thought he was such a incredible person. I just observed his mannerisms and how he interacted with the executives, the managers, the lawyers, the artists, the radio people, and he was always so good to everybody, and he was such a good people person. And I remember the first time he took me to lunch at the Jolly Rogers on Sunset and Coingo when he was at, oh my goodness, uh, at, you know, not yes. far from Martoni's, right where CNN is now. Exactly. Yes, yes, I remember. So I thought that was cool, but I remember <laughs> one time we were at Casablanca and we went to dinner with Randy Roker, okay, who had actually hired him, and we went to Old World Restaurant, yes, on Caddy Sunset. Corner from uh, Sunset Tower Records. Yeah, right on Sunset where uh, Holloway. Holloway. Yes, absolutely. So anyway, I still remember ordering a Salisbury <laughs> steak and all that. And it was time to pay and Gerald went in his wallet and he pulled out this green American Express card and he said, I'll, I'll take care of it. And it made such an impression on me where I said, oh, that's the cool guy at the table. He's the guy. He's the guy. Even though he had an expense account it was going to be written off, it's just the way he did it and the, the way it made everybody feel. I just, wow, it's just amazing. And so when he was at Casablanca, I used to go up there and, you know, I was a guy before they had street teams. You're yes, going you in the high it. schools and you that, were it. that was the whole I thing. I remember gathering records. Zeus is coming. <laughs> Get the records. That was my job. Go to the mailroom and get the records for Zeus. And then I would have my little list of the records that Gerald wanted to be pushed for that time. Cameo. Yes. Parlette. Yes. Brides of Funkenstein. And, and a lot of them had, were barking as I was giving them to. Hey, look, we even worked uh, shares. Take me home. Hey, that was that huge. was a hit. That was huge. I remember Gerald introducing me to Donna Summers in the lobby of uh, Casablanca. That was a big moment, and Neil Bogart. I mean, it was some great people. But I remember Gerald asked me to 
come in his office one time. He says, look, you like being casual because I used to wear sweatsuits and stuff. You know, Because I, I used to work out at Gold's Gym and all that stuff. He says, now you're a record executive. <laughs> you need to kind of step up your clothes, your attire. I said, okay. I, ever since then, I just put on a suit you know but he was such a great mentor and actually Shelly used to call me Busby Jr. <laughs> and it was really cool one time she answered Gerald's phone and she said Jesus Garber's office and I'm just looking at her and I go man that sounds kind of cool <laughs> I need to make sure I get myself in that position where somebody's saying that you know but it was really great but at Motown what I learned was the politics and the politics were that you had to be very careful one and more important than one is very very honest because someone could walk in your office and say I want you to listen to this now someone you've never met in your life that person could be a Gordy a relative distant relative cousin married something that's working on a project and you had to be very honest and fair and kind at the same time. That really taught me a lot about internal politics at a company. I remember one of the big moments was uh, in 1981. Skip called me in his office, Skip Miller, who was another great mentor of mine, and I love him dearly. He says, look, you're going out on the road for two weeks with Jermaine Jackson. I said, where, where, where are we going, San Francisco, uh, Seattle? I thought it was my turn. No, he says, you're going the whole country. I said, well, what? I'm just a Western regional. He said, look, Hazel Gordy, Jermaine's wife, asked her dad to have you go on the road with Jermaine. I said, oh, okay. So it was great, you know. I didn't know why that happened, but it happened. I did the same thing with, with Rick and Tina. And in 1983, February, the whole month, I went out on the road with Jabarge. Wow. And they had a record that was really hot on the West Coast called All This Love. Mm-hmm. And I like it. We had done about 70,000 units or albums sold. We went out on the road for the whole month. By the time we came back, the album was gold. Wow. At that time in 1983. 500,000 units? Exactly. Mm -hmm. So it was really exciting, but Skip said to me, look, just because you're out on the road doesn't mean you can neglect the Western region. We didn't have phones, mobile phones, but we did have one little thing that I loved technologically, and that is I had an MCI phone card. (laughs) So while they were doing an interview during lunch... Uh, Old school card. Yes. Punch in 20 million numbers before you can actually make the phone call. And then you get the dial tone. Yes. So, but the cool thing is once you finish that call, you can press the pound button and you get a fresh dial tone. And it keeps billing it. Uh So I thought, oh, this is brilliant. So while they're having lunch, I'm working and calling the radio stations and making sure they're playing our records and all that kind of stuff. So it was great. It was an incredible experience. And uh, I wanted to grow in the business. And I wanted to go to the next step, which was the national promotion person. I really wasn't asking for that position, but it piqued my curiosity. What did that mean? I got passed up three different times. You know, as an actor, it is so important to set your goals and have intentions. I know a lot of people hate setting goals. They see it as resolutions and they can't do it and it doesn't work. Well, I have a little booklet to help you because I've been doing goals for, oh my God, at least 40 years. And I have found that setting goals really helps me when I am intentional, I am focused, and I'm on point. So I have put together a little booklet to help you out, and it's free. So why don't you type your name, your email address, and press the button, and I can send it to you right away. Gerald Busby at another company, actually he was uh, had left A&M and went to MCA, said you need to go to A&M. Gerald was all about what's moving the next up. phase? Yes, moving, up. moving up. How are you evolving? How are you growing as an executive? You can't stay stagnant. So it was one of the hardest decisions I ever made in my life to say yes. And not till I had a conversation with Clarence Avon. He says, look, Herb Albert and Jerry Moss are good people. He said, they personally helped me. And I'm telling you, 
you need to go. Today, most people will say, you know, I'm going to give you a week or two before I, I'm leaving because they really like their employer and they don't want to burn a bridge. And some people say, hey, look, five o'clock, I'm out. Well, I gave Skip Miller a written notice seven weeks in advance. Wow. Because it was that hard. He couldn't believe it either. <laughs> I ended up leaving a gentleman by the name of Step Johnson, great promotion guy, had a great career at A&M, went to Capitol and Interscope. I really respect him. He taught me a lot, hired me, and I went to work with him and John McClain. John McClain was the executive producer of the Control album for Janet and Rhythm Nation and a bunch of other things. And he today is the co-executor of the Michael Jackson estate. A&M was a lot of fun. I didn't think things would get any better than Motown, but boy, amazing. And you were there how many years? Five. Wow. Within six months, they decided I was the National West Coast, which was great. Everything from Cleveland to the West Coast, and I had five regional reps I oversaw, and mm -hmm. it was great. They decided they needed a marketing person. So I thought they were going to bring somebody else in, and they added that duty to, to me. <laughs> And the first song we worked at a and in 85 from its inception was Sting's Set Them Free. Wow. So that was like, gave me goosebumps. Woo, this wow. is a hit. Janet Jackson came along and John McClain had us listen to the song and the, the whole album. And it was just he, Rich Calloway, who was our West Coast Regional and myself. I think we probably hung out in the lot listening to it in his car till late and then I got home and it was about four in the morning and John's calling me we're talking and the whole thing and someone turned up in the video nasty that's right twice yes they didn't pay me but <laughs> it was fun I'll tell you the story on that Bob Reitman was the head of marketing and Step Johnson head of urban promotion. I'm answering to both guys. Bob said, well, here, you're going to do the marketing plan on this Janet Jackson Control album. And so here it is. I'm ambitious. I, I already listened to it. And he says, well, what's your plan? I said, look, I'd like for her to go out on the road for three weeks with myself and a bodyguard. And I like all three of us first class <laughs> limousines with a phone in there. And I want her to have five-star hotels and I want her in a suite. And he said to me, you must be crazy. I said, well, look, the truth is, this is a hit record. He says, no, the truth is, I'm a numbers person. And the first album sold 150,000 records. The second one sold 120. She's going down. <laughs> She's on the drop list. I said, but I, have you listened to the album? I said, this is a smash album. This record is incredible. How do you know? I said, because I know. Rick James, three million. Stevie, eight million. Lionel Richie, can't slow down. 10 million. I know how those things feel. And I, well, how do you know? What guarantee? We only do this for our biggest artists, Brian Adams and Sting. I said, well, listen, I tell you what. If it doesn't work at the end of the tour, when I come back, you can fire me. I won't have any recourse around the, uh, against the company. I'll say bye. Thank you for the opportunity. We made sure that we integrated urban, R&B radio, and pop pop press, urban press, everything. And I still remember the first market we went into. And before we got out of the limousine, I said to Janet, look, I got to tell you something in preparing you for this first interview. It was John Landis, uh, Morning Q at, at Houston. And she says, what? I said, I need you to do me a favor. She says, what's that? I said, well, your brothers, they have a history of answering questions by one word. All righty. Thank you. I said, that ain't going to cut it. I want you to walk into these radio stations like a United States senator, extend <laughs> your hand, and say, hi, I'm Janet Jackson. What is your name? What do you do here? She did it. I mean, knowing she was an right. actress before, right. she was spot on, and it was electric because people were interacting with the Jackson on a whole different personal mm -hmm. level, mm -hmm. and she was interested in what they did and thanking them for the support and stuff. And it was, it was just, that album ended up doing 20 million. You know, in the early 80s, it was my father who took me to a and Records when I was this, this unproven 14 year old. Herb Alpert, Jerry Moss, they had enough faith in me to give me a record deal. And I'm forever grateful to you and to the entire and in family, which includes you, Jesus, God. Wow. 
Wow. And do you think you were ready to help her because you saw what happened with Jermaine? Because you took him on the road. Yes. But, you know, every one of my steps was a preparation for something else. And that preparation was for Janet. Because that really was explosive. The fans were incredible. I mean, because even with DeBarge, the reaction of the fans when we would do in stores, which were record shops where people used to buy music. Right. I know you guys download and stream now, but it was the correct way to buy <laughs> records because you really supported your artists. Right. But now you're just kind of not helping your artists by not buying the whole album. But the main thing is it was the closest thing in 1983 with DeBarge as it is to experiencing being in the movie Hard Day's Night with the Beatles where you have the pandemonium and you're running into the to the limo and you got a crowd of 500 girls beating on the windows screaming you know in-store promotions were exciting back in the day I mean to bring in an artist and have a lot of people not being able to get in and being outside nothing like it absolutely nothing like it it was magic mm -hmm. it was really magic because you got close to the artist get an autograph take a picture it was wonderful i i was just so happy about that and then the rhythm nation album came along and it, that was magical too but while i was at a and m we had some other breakthrough artists i mean brenda russell had uh, piano in the dark which elite adams did wonderful. later you had all these hit records coming through a and M, you you were more seasoned now. You were getting more responsibility. What was the next step for you? Polygram started buying up all the independent companies, uh, Motown Island, and A and M was one of them. They dismissed the senior management, the president, the head of sales and distribution, and myself on the same day. But I have to tell you, the way A and M says happy trails to you, they could say happy trails to me every day. Wow! They were wonderful. Herb Alpert and Jerry Moss are the salt of the earth. They've done so mm. many good things for so many people mm. quietly without asking for any acknowledgement, but they made an incredible impact on my life. Wow. So I went over to Zoo Entertainment, mm -hmm. which was part of BMG. I worked the Phyllis Hyman record. We gave her her first number one. Don't want to change the world, just want to be your girl. The album went gold. And then uh, I stayed there for a year and a half. I consulted over at Scotty Brothers Records, which they had Weird Al Yankovic mm -hmm. and a couple other people. But the big thing that they had was Baywatch, the TV show. They asked me to stay on. I was supposed to be there for seven weeks and ended up being there seven months. And they said, well, we want you to stay and we're going to sell the company and we're going to give you some stock. And it was very tempting, but I got an offer to go work at the Walt Disney Company. How amazing. So I prayed on it, and in my sleep, the answer came, and I said, I got to go. And I went to the Walt Disney Company, and I was a part of The Lion King and Pocahontas. Now, they were just starting a record company when you went over there? It was about two years already in. Okay. Peter Paterno, who is a very accomplished, successful lawyer, he currently is the lawyer for Dr. Dre and also for Eminem and a bunch of other successful artists. He was the president at the time and he really got it. He had done a joint venture with Maurice Starr. And Maurice Starr was a big producer of that time. Maurice Starr was the manager, producer, and writer of the New Kids on the Block. And I remember going to Boston to meet with him and he said, you know, the thing I'm most proud about with New Kids on the Block is besides I had all the publishing, the management, we're touring, we're doing great. He said in the height of the world tour, guess how much we netted in merchandising? I said, I don't know, two, three million, four? He says, no, we did a billion dollars. Wow. So I said, okay, right on, wow. right on Peter Paterno. You're getting the right people. <laughs> Here. Wow. And we had, you know, a uh, uh, low down, dirty shame, and a couple other soundtracks. So basically, mm -hmm. we were working soundtracks, and they never really signed urban artists, or the commitment wasn't there. Peter, unfortunately, had written a letter, ended up having a negative connotuity because he was comparing how, say, Capitol Records and all their extensive catalog, how they have money coming in, and, and how 
you need to really develop stuff. And he did a deal with the group Queen and bought the catalog for, I don't know, $7 million. And people balked at it. And I think it's probably done $100 million. So wow. Peter was right. What was uh, amazing is that it kind of reminded me of the Jerry Maguire movie where Jerry wrote something, a memo, and he was frowned upon because he was honest and truthful. But Peter kept going. But the replacement for Peter was not the most seasoned person. I would just say just it wasn't the right person. it's because that wasn't their area of expertise as far as, you know, it's not Disney. Disney is movies, it's cartoons, it's animation. But, but nobody sells records like Disney because while the record business unfortunately shot themselves in the foot by cutting the credit out to all the retailers, mm-hmm. Disney has a retail system. Mm-hmm. Disney does forty billion dollars a year in wow. merchandising, so they get it. They not don't close the stores. When the Herb Alpers, Jerry Moss, Barry Gordy, Chris Blackwell, Dick Griffey's, those guys that own their own companies, mm-hmm. when they sold out, the new guys got hoodwinked and said, "Hey, look, let's just go to Apple. They're going to be the biggest distributor. We don't have to worry about returns. Okay, we don't have to worry about shipping. It's just send them a WAV file or MP." three you know they'll just send us money and the problem was that we went from a dollar business to a fraction of a penny i mean i was working tito jackson's record last year and he says man my royalty statements suck they're nothing compared to how they used to be so can you imagine you take not a dollar but a penny and Mm. make it into 10 fractions you know it takes a long time to even get one penny right The problem with the music business is that it's not leading. Where Apple is leading because Apple has a retail system. They actually have a place where brick and mortar, people have to go into an Apple store. And if you need a repair, you need to make an appointment. Mm -hmm. But if you want to buy a new product, you come on in anytime. It's all in the same place. It's all set up perfectly Mm -hmm. for Apple, but not for the record business. Mm -hmm. Say, for instance, when I was coming up, people had a tremendous respect for art. One of the things that people in everybody's homes that they were proud of is their music collection. Mm -hmm. It was art. You want to hear Miles Davis, Dizzy Gillespie, The Supremes, Marvin Gaye, whoever, you pulled it out, carefully put it on the turntable. Or if you had a CD, it was still great because you had liner notes. You know who wrote it, who arranged it, who who was BMI, ASCAP, who's got the Mm -hmm. publishing. It was a story. It's like looking at a a Renoir, Cezanne, Picasso, Mm -hmm. Jack Pollock, whoever. That's art. And we're now disrespecting. And the liner notes were usually written by somebody famous. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Who knew the background. Yes. So it made that whole experience more complete. Here's something that I really analyzed for myself. I said, you know, when I was a kid, I still remember the first record I bought, and I bought it because I was a space junkie. I liked the movie uh, Forbidden Planet, and I liked Star Trek mm-hmm. before Star Wars. And I, you know, mm-hmm. And there was a song on Motown that the beginning started with an oscillator sound it went and that song was a supreme song reflections Mm. and i said oh that's some space stuff (laughs) i gotta buy it and i bought that my first record was a motown record but the thing is what we used to have was a encapsulated memory in our brain which is the deepest part is the hippocampus and we think about the fact that I remember that day. It was a sunny day. It was summer. I remember that moment when I bought it or when I went into the Mm -hmm. record shop and there was a lot of people at Tower Records or Virgin Megastore or Strawberries, whatever record, big record chain you went to or the local mom and pop. It was an experience and it was part of your life. Anyone that's looking at this blog is honest with themselves, cannot say, hmm, I remember the moment I pushed the download button on that song. (laughs) That is so forgettable. I remember going to the record stores, like saving up my money to go to the record store and just tearing the cellophane off the record. I was like, oh my God, I got this. And then the same thing with the CD. It is an experience. And some stores are bringing back vinyl. Like I I noticed there's like a little resurgence. There is. Of some vinyl coming in. I like digital for some things, but there's something about holding the actual physical thing in your hand 
reading, looking at the picture. It, it's just uh, delightful to be able to do that. It's kind of like with the Bible. I love the fact that I can put it on my phone and in a moment's notice, pull it up. But there's nothing like that Bible, that physical Bible that I could smell, I could touch, I could write in. I, I don't know about you, but I used to write on my album covers like write my name oh yeah yeah, yeah. Like, oh yeah yeah, yeah yeah <laughs> and yeah. do a real big oh yeah no i used to make little notes which what yes. were the hits yes yes but you know it's just and then there were some album tracks that never saw any kind of activity at radio but you knew there was some yes. hit songs yes. on there you yes. know so al green when he had the call me album there was a song called have you been making out okay it was a masterpiece mm -hmm. or jesus is waiting yes i mean it was like oh my god this is amazing it's a disservice to your customers record business it's a disservice because you've gone from a 40 billion dollar a year global business barely eking out a, a billion or two billion dollars so it's your fault lack of leadership lack of vision take your business back and control it because people as they say if you build it they will come well okay so here's here's the thing because of technology artists now have more control than they did back in the day they don't need a mega company to distribute them, they go on YouTube, they get on Spotify, they get on Pandora, and they start building, you know, through social media, start building their own fan base. And where is the fit for the record business now? Because it's almost like, why are they needed? You know? I have a great answer for that. Tell me. Okay, first of all, even though that anyone that has equipment in their home can load up to Spotify Rhapsody and all these different aggregates, Apple Music, those Spotify Rhapsody and all those people, they get about 500 submissions a day globally. So you think about why do some people have a lot of streams and some people don't have? So the way those people at those streaming services have figured it out, there's a lot of streets out here. They put you in neighborhoods mm -hmm. where there's no traffic. You are on a nice little side street. You're in the system but you're on a side street. So what you want to do is get on the big boulevards, Fifth Avenue, Avenue of the Stars, uh, Sunset, Wilshire, mm -hmm. Hollywood Boulevard, where there's hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. How do you do that? We well, have to hire someone mm -hmm. that has the internal relationship with those people that knows their language, that is politically savvy within how they work, that knows how to tell them what the status is of the record, on the charts. So would that publicity. be a promotion person? That would be a internet marketing person. Oh, okay. What's the difference between that and a promotion person? A promotion person, their principal job is to interact with the radio stations that are reporters to Media Base, which is owned by iHeart in San Antonio, but their offices are here in Sherman Oaks, and by Billboard, which uh, is BDS. Mm -hmm. And Billboard actually purchased radio and records. Back in the 70s, they had a lot of turntable hits. Mm -hmm. And what a turntable hit meant, like if we're here in Los Angeles, someone in Florida or Washington, D.C. or Philadelphia or Chicago or Cleveland, St. Louis, say, oh, Lydia, we added your record. And you go, oh, great. And then you ship records into that market to all the record shops but it's not selling they, <laughs> those guys basically what they called was paper ads so actually along comes nielsen bds and i remember terry which Ruff is a system that lets you know what is being played played but it's more sophisticated than that bds leased the service it's a computer system that was used by the defense department to track nuclear submarines around the world. Basically in Kansas City, what they would, they had the main base, and what they did was they had monitoring stations in all these different markets. And what it did in actuality was you sent your song, and then it was encoded and it created a pattern. Just like with the submarines, the submarines, even though they're nuclear and stealth as they move, they create a sound pattern. So they know there's a Soviet one there and a German one there and that one's ours. It's so sophisticated. So they did that to music. So the paper ads went away. So the guys that were lying, they had no recourse because you could say, hey, Joe, you ain't playing my record. How you know? 
You're not showing up. And so MediaBase did something similar, but MediaBase actually employs people in all these different markets that are sitting, listening to stations and are manually logging this in. If you look at MediaBase and BDS, they're pretty much equal. Okay. BDS stands for Broadcast Data System that's owned by Billboard. And MediaBase is basically music info systems. And uh, it's fascinating because they basically can tell you when the song is played, at what time, how many times. And so now if you want a number one song in Billboard or MediaBase, it's all based on how many times your record gets played that week. So the song in a format that gets the most actual detections, spins, is the number one song for the week. Wow. Tell me what the Jesus Garber Company does. The Jesus Garber Company specializes in urban adult radio promotion. I found that to be my lane. A lot of my competitors work both urban, AC, and urban. 1995, BDS and MediaBase decided to split the formats. So urban radio, which used to be Mm R&B, is basically hip-hop intensive. Urban AC is basically ballads. Okay. I kind of like to keep my blood pressure down (laughs) and I like to keep things cool and smooth. I'm not relating. I think that hip-hop is great. It has lasted a long time. It's the pop music of today. Mm -hmm. It's all good, but my lane is smooth. And and you know, I have a preference. I'm Mm -hmm. an American that can Mm -hmm. decide my choice and my choice was I saw that underserved, and when I was at the Walt Disney Company, I transitioned from vice president of Urban, which I was the first vice president of Urban for the company. I decided to go this route, and they asked me to continue on as a consultant, so I did, and I love it, because it's just great. What I love about it, if I can compare the two formats, is that hip-hop, the audience is very, I get it, I get it, very hyper. It's kind of like if I were to compare it to a man and a woman, men are kind of like microwaves. Mm -hmm. Push the button, done. And that's what hip hop is. It's like, go, go, go. We're popping, we're rolling, we're bouncing. It's all good. And that's great. But to me, it's a disservice to the art Mm -hmm. because I'm Mm pro-artist and pro, I love songs. And I want them to be around a long time. So I made a wise choice going with Urban AC because Urban AC is like, a woman, which would you call a crock pot. <laughs> In the complimentary man, takes, <laughs> takes a long time, time to heat slow, up. But when it's done, it's delicious. Yes, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> I've had songs that have lasted 18 months on the chart because the audience loved the song so much. A big name hip hop artist, they can literally go through a whole album in six months mm-hmm. and that audience is saying, I love you, but give me some more. Give me something else, right. Give me something fresh, because I'm really impatient. I'm working on bouncing, moving. I don't have time for waiting. I gotta keep it moving. And I like the smooth part. I like the song. It's beautiful. It touches my heart. It's romantic. It's inspiring it makes me smile you know i that's why i'm in that lane i love hip-hop i love the grooves there's certain songs i just absolutely love but at the same time for me professionally i'm glad that i chose urban adult so you have been consistent in promotions for over 40 years 44 okay 44 years yeah that is phenomenal it's a blessing yeah but it's also phenomenal that you love what you do so much that that's what you do how many people do we know that the lifespan might have been eight years and then they were on to something else it's true i mean i'm very grateful because you know in the time that i worked at motown i tell people when you say the analogy really love what you're doing i thought they were dumb And the only reason I thought they were dumb is because they were paying me. I would have showed up for free. I mean, to be around Jermaine and Rick and Tina. But you were with history. Oh my, I can pinch myself. I know I'm blessed. I remember the day I'm in the hallway and Barry Gordy's walking down towards me with three other people following him. And he said, how you doing, Jesus? I thought I died and went to heaven. 
that was a moment for me. I mean, he acknowledged me. Wow. You talked about Gerald. Yeah. You just talked about Barry Gordy. If you had to say one person made the biggest difference in your life as a record man and as a man of God, who would that person be that was in the record business? Gerald Busby. Hands down. He had the biggest impact, but there were other great people. The Skip Millers, the Miller Londons, Boo Frazier. When I left Motown, went to A&M, Skip said, okay, look, when you go to A&M, get with Boo. I got with Boo. And Boo was the coolest guy in the world. Boo was at A&M when I worked at uh, BLS. Wow. And yeah. Boo was a great friend of our friend, Hal Jackson. That's right. People don't really... In- really know the history of inner city broadcasting you know wbls if it weren't for hal jackson and his relationships with the bank in new york they would have never gotten the loan to open up inner city broadcasting what was a tragedy is that when they sold inner city hal got nothing that to me was a horrible evil Thing that was done to Hal. Yes, it was. He put his life, his sweat, his blood, his tears into inner city. And at the end of the day, none of that was remembered. And I tell you, that was the nail that closed his coffin. That when that happened, Hal it. went physically down. Yeah. That was it. It took everything out of him. And I will say something that Hal always used to say all the time is put time on it, they'll get theirs back. But I still, you just when you said that, it made me think of you, the judge, and myself went to lunch at La Dome one time. Oh, my. What a privilege that was. What a smart guy he was. And Percy Sutton, what a brilliant man yes, he, he was. was. The whole thing is, you know, it, it, it's really about numbers, and it was an unnecessary loan to expand inner city that took place, and that loan had a lot of strings attached yes. to it that forced them. It wasn't smart. And it, yeah, wasn't, it wasn't was not needed. Yeah. I mean, you know, remember B.K. Kirkland, yes. who's now on I XM? Love BK. Yes. I love B.K. He was the program director. I was at KBLX when they first came on in San Francisco in 1979. They switched over from KRE to KBLX. And I remember it was a young lady by the name of Beverly Myers was the first program director. Then BK came along. What the story is that they were proud of, Harvey Stone was the general manager and BK was the program director. KBLX was such a hit radio station. It was like a cash machine and all they had to do was send the money to New York, to inner city's headquarters every month and leave them alone. And it's not that they had a problem financially. See, the the whole thing changed in 1996 with one of my favorite presidents, Bill Clinton, which I think he made a huge mistake. He signed in the Telecommunications Act. Before 1996, You, if you own radio stations, you can only have seven. You can only have seven television stations. Now, you could have affiliates. That's how the networks did, but they had to deal with other owners. What happened was they created a lot of 800-pound gorillas. When you can own 1,200, 1,300 radio stations, it's unmanageable. Too much. Yeah, it's too and much. see, Part of the problem with radio today, it's such a logistic nightmare that they took the, sh- the shortcut. And the shortcut is they weighed so much of the programming on syndication. Mm-hmm. And so you think about, oh, that's easy. We'll put Tommy's show and Betty Sue's show on. And we don't have to worry about hiring people. And they misunderstood the value of local news, local radio, local. That was your base, is the local. Exactly. Yeah. But from a numbers point of view, I remember the late Carl Connors. He was a program director at KMJQ in Houston and unfortunately passed away last year. Great programmer, great guy, had a long career. But he explained to me that they did a cost analysis of running a morning show syndication. And they said, you know, we can actually hire a team for 350000 to half a million dollars to be a really great morning show. Pay them well and get the numbers, but they want us to just run a syndication show. And when we did the comparison, just in mornings, because syndication takes all your units, which are your commercials for those four hours, on an annual basis, they were losing $7 million a year just in the morning show. You think about why are all these 
companies in bankruptcy today because they're giving away their money and instead of investing in local talent as you said and hiring people at a you know if you look at numbers at the end of the day why run a business if you're not going to make money but if you're going to run a business to just give away stuff because you're lazy and you're not developing talent and you're not developing local talent and you're not giving people an opportunity to work but it's easy to have somebody on 300 stations you're giving away your money but you know there's people that went to business schools that say they're right. So did you go to business school? My university was Motown. <laughs> and I'm a graduate from Motown. And I'm my, a graduate from inner city broadcasting. <laughs> and my finishing school was A&M Records. <laughs> my finishing school was Casablanca Records. <laughs> and and Gerald a, Busby was my dean. What an amazing place. Oh, man. Casablanca. Oh, man. It was a party. It was an amazing time. And I wish that everybody had a Gerald Busby. Yes. I wish everybody coming out of school has a Gerald Busby. Yes. Someone that allows you to cr be creative, explore. One of his superpowers, as I like to call it, was Gerald knew where you fit. You know, he would hire people and, and maybe within a month, two months, he goes, you know what? You'll be better over there. Or he would say, what do you like to do? And listening to them, he knew it, it immediately. The first time I saw that with him was with Bill Marin. Oh, yeah. Because Bill came in as a promotion guy after Sheila Eldridge. And Great people. Boy, did I give Bill hell. I used to wear him out. I mean, <laughs> I love Bill. And, and we worked through our differences. But in the beginning, I was like... Clashing. Really? Is that what you're doing? That's not going to work. We're not doing that. You would have thought I was his boss the way I talked to him. Gerald was able to see his value and where he soared. And I remember he took him out of promotion and put him into doing the bilingual music. All those songs that he worked on became big hits. KC and the Sunshine Band and Terry Desario, they had a duet. Yeah. There were Captain and Tennille, they did a, um, a Latin version. Yeah. He did a Latin version I'm ready. to all that these was, songs. Yes. Yeah. Her and Brooklyn Dreams. Yeah. Oh, 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 oh. It just was amazing. And I saw him do it time after time with people if they were willing to trust him. They got a career. You know, in describing Gerald, he was our Tony Robbins. Yes, he was. That's a good uh, analogy. Yeah, yes. he was our Tony Robbins. He made you see the potential within yourself and how to evolve and grow. So he was such a force of nature. I, I love him, but I will tell you this. In retrospect, as kind as he was and helped me along every step, you know, and I have to give Clarence uh, Avant a lot of credit too, because he really was always a straight shooter and a great friend and someone I admire and respect and has done a lot. There should be a book about him that is required reading in every business school because he has been involved in so many great things. But with Gerald, I can say I gave him a, a real nice repayment. You know, all cosmic and divine, and it was just being obedient to the spirit because Gerald was the hottest label at uh, MCA. He had an incredible opportunity to make that label hot, and there was a gentleman by the name of Irving Azoff. Irving let Gerald do his magic, he didn't say, Jero, you got to run through hoops because, you know, the truth is, if you work in black music, John McClain, I have to quote him, you're working under freedom under the installment program. <laughs> I mean, John is one of the funniest people I ever met and a great guy. And he was right. And, you know, if you compare the budgets that would go to the pop department, the pop department would get a 300 train load of goodies go make it happen urban department we get a book of matches <laughs> and say now use each match to make it hot make it hot <laughs> so disproportionately the budgets were not right so here comes irving azoff and says gerald just make it hot i don't care just do what you got to do if you really believe in it i believe in you spend the money never happened to a black person mm -hmm. in the music business mm -hmm. ever since it was amazing because it was the same 
mentality that Neil Bogart had at Casablanca, yes. which was, nothing's off the table, get my records. And the only last person that had the guts, the chutzpah to do that, was Jimmy Iovine at Interscope. He's like, whatever you got to do, don't tell me about it. Just make it happen. <laughs> I love those kind of people because, you know, if you want to get in entertainment, the record business, it's a gamble. And if you want to hedge your bet, that's the reason. You got to have that. But with respect to Gerald, it was so hot at MCA and they wanted to reward him. They were going to reactivate a, a label called Uni which is universal. And Jero had me take a meeting with him and Irving Azoff about me come, leaving A&M to be the vice president and general manager to start that company. And boy, was that a tempting opportunity. And Jero was going to end up going over and whatever. I was really thinking about it. And at that time, Herb Alpert and Jerry Moss did something that was amazing. They loaned me the down payment for my house. Mm -hmm. And I really was, whoo, my head was spinning. Oh my God, I'm gonna be a homeowner. Here it is, this Mexican that lives in Inglewood, gonna have a chance to buy a house because these nice people believe in what and appreciate what I'm doing for their company. Wow. Herb and Jerry heard about it, but then they made me a vice president. And what was interesting is that Herb Alpert said something to me that really just had me, my head spinning. He saw me about to leave the lot and he stops me. He said, I'm so glad you're gonna be staying with us because you belong here. And I have to tell you something, he says, you have the kind of spirit that reminds me of Jerry and I when we built this company. Mm -hmm. And I can't say that for the rest of the people here. Wow. It's like he just shot me. Wow. I'm yours, I'm here. So I had to tell Gerald and Irving I'm staying. And Gerald's like, why are you staying? This is Well, the good thing for Gerald, because I didn't take that job, he, MCA, ended up acquiring Motown. And Mr. Gordy wanted that there was a 10% minority ownership. And Clarence Avant negotiated that. And Gerald got it, right? Gerald got it. Yes. And Mr. Gordy had sold the company for $61 million, which actually broke my heart because I'm looking at Variety the next day. A Sylvester Stallone movie went over budget for $63 million. I said, how do you compare mm -hmm. a Sylvester Stallone movie or any movie? I love Sylvester. With Motown. With Motown. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. The good thing is that Gerald ended up being able to sell Motown again later for $335 wow. million. And so that meant he got $35 million. Mm. So he said to me, I'm glad you said no. <laughs> and I said, you're welcome. <laughs> and that's, you know, I give that glory and, and credit wow. to God because that was divine. And it worked out for me at A&M and it worked out for him. And mm -hmm. it was just a blessing. But I wanted to go back to an earlier question. We talked about streaming and the difference and all that. And why would someone need a big record company yes. today? Okay, here's my answer to all those would-be artists, writers, and all that. Mm -hmm. The record company is basically a bank. And if they believe in you, they will spend the money to market and promote your product at radio, at the internet, publicity, support your tour, live shows, the whole thing. And you need that. I've seen superstar artists that will leave a label, have a beautiful recording studio in their garage, and say, oh man, I just cut a hit, great. You send your record to all the radio stations. Unless you have someone speaking for you, their language, they're not gonna play it. Mm -hmm. Michael Jackson can come back today if they don't hire a promotion person or Prince, our biggest mm -hmm. artist, mm -hmm. you're not gonna get mm -hmm. anything. They'll listen to it and say, oh yeah, it sounds great but nothing will happen. I want you to tell that artist out there who is trying to get in the business, trying to get a record, what are maybe three things they need to know before they jump into the pool? The entertainment business, regardless of what facet, is for serious people. So if you're just playing at it, or if you think you're just gonna shoot a little high eight video with a bunch of girls in bikinis at the pool and you're just trying to get over, you're wasting your time. 
But if you're serious about the songs you write from your heart, the songs you sing and perform, and you really want to do this, if you catch a hit, you're going to be singing that song in front of people all over the world. Think about it for the next 50 years. So at the end of the day, what you need is you need to be real with yourself, and then you need a team. Because at the end of the day, people say, who speaks for you? We don't want to hear you. We want to know who speaks for you. Who is your manager? Who is your lawyer? Those are the first two people you got to have. You're not going to get an agent till your record is in top 10 or number one because agents are not interested in wasting their time. And the bulk of your money today will be through live shows. So you got to have a hit. So you got to have a team, a brain trust that is there soundly for you. You cannot do it all yourself it is impossible because you can't manage the schedules and the meetings and you got to be the artist you got to be creative and creative people if you want to be successful you got to be happy you got to be chilled you got to be in a good state of mind a good frame of mind where you're calm and you allow those thoughts and words to come to you i mean you know dizzy gillespie wrote night in tunisia in 1940 on a napkin on top of a garbage can. Biggest song for him, song's 80 years old, still produces a half a million dollars in publishing today. It comes to you when you are in that mode. You can't be like, oh, I gotta go to this meeting and I'm... Everybody's a specialist, but get the right manager, get the right lawyer that are giving you the correct advice and they are the foundation of your team because you gotta have a team. What's the best advice you ever got? from Gerald Busby. Early on at Stax Records, he said the person that taught him the cornerstone of promotion was a woman by the name of Effie Smith. She was a promotion person in Memphis. And she said, never promise anything you cannot deliver, but deliver everything you promise. And that's been my credo still today. Tell me your favorite quote. My favorite quote is, great spirits have always encountered violent opposition from mediocre minds. Mm. Albert Einstein. Thing is, you cannot quit because you have an idea and someone doesn't understand it. They don't get it because they're so absorbed into their devices and their emails and their websites and their their lives to get an idea of someone that was a genius. It really, really holds true that you have to stick to your plan. I mean, Barry White, who I brought over to A&M, who was actually in bankruptcy at the time and it turned his life around and saved his home. He was a dear, one of my best friends in life. He explained to me that when he was a songwriter for Motown, he ended up writing songs and recording them that he felt he was the only one to be able to do them. And what he said to me, which was very inspiring, is that he shared those songs with people and people would say, oh, no, Barry, nobody's going to ever play your songs on the radio. Your voice is too deep. They're not going to... And, you know, instead of him becoming defensive, emotional, he had a wonderful, wonderful response. And he said, you might be right. And Barry ended up selling in excess of 140 million albums worldwide. So he did not allow someone's criticism of his thoughts or dreams to be diminished or perish or whatever is going on. He just stuck to his plan and it paid off. And that's the same thing I will say to you. I love your blog and I hope that all those wonderful people out there tell their friends and check you out because you are covering things with substance and it's not mindless gibberish. I don't want them to have to waste so much life figuring it out. It's like, here it is, figure it out so you can get where you got to go quicker. I spent all the money learning all this stuff, taking classes and doing this and doing that and going down the wrong path. And I feel like I've got information to give people so that they don't have to waste that time. They can just get to what they need to get to. I spend so much time not being in my lane mm-hmm. so that if I could give it to somebody else and say, no, stay in your lane because it is so valuable. It takes more time to get the plane up in the air than to keep it in the air. So much uh, fuel 
has to be used. And as performers, sometimes we waste so much energy trying to get something up. And then as soon as we're getting ready to just coast, we bring the plane back down. I was driving down La Brea, just down the street from the old a and And I stopped at the light on Santa Monica and I'm waiting and I see this guy in a wheelchair wheeling himself across. Mm-hmm. Now he was about this much away from the the curb that he was trying to get to. But he saw the blinking lights and he literally turned the wheelchair around and went back to where he started from. And I was in the car yelling, no, don't do that. And he went right back and then waited for the light again. And that stayed with me because that's what we as artists do sometimes. We are so close to the finish line, but somebody says something to us and they become that red flashing light. No, you don't have what it takes. No, you can't do it. No, da 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 and on and on and on. What do we do? We turn and go back to the beginning. If we could just stay steady as artists, no matter what anybody says, turn down those voices and get to the curb. Get to the curb you want to get to and stay in your lane. You don't have to go anywhere else because God created you if you Listen internally. God will direct your steps. He will speak to you. He will order your steps. He will bring you the success. But too many times we turn down God's voice and turn up the critics' voices. That's really what these vlogs are about. You're so right. That internal voice we all have is the Holy Spirit that is in everybody, regardless of how you believe or practice it's in everybody. But Lynn Manuel said something uh, on 60 Minutes that was relevant to what you're saying. And that is, he said when he saw what he wanted, he didn't walk towards it. He ran mm-hmm. towards it. He went, and I said, wow, that's what I did. In the Heights took him a bunch of years. And then Hamilton took seven years. It's that thing also of being patient in your lane and not worrying about it's got to happen tomorrow because I got to pay the rent tomorrow. But just going, no, it's going to happen. Just slow and steady wins the race. You know, take your time. Do it right. Do it right, Right, baby. baby. (laughs) You can do it. It's plan (laughs) save on SOS band. (laughs) That's right. But you know what you said about the seven years. Dizzy Gillespie uh, said, and I I got this from Boo Frazier, he said, there is no shortcut to real success. And that's what you want, real success. You don't want fake success which is people lying to you misleading you and getting you up you know you got to be there you can't miss the turnaround so you can't get new with people and mistreat people you got to go out of your way to be kind to people because anybody can be a jerk that's the easiest thing anybody could use profanity anybody can put someone else down and i remember gerald calling me one time when he was at a&m and i was at motown he says it is much harder for a person to be kind and nice than to be a jerk because anybody could be a jerk but to take it on the chin and remain solid in your character as the person who you are and not compromise and put people down or belittle them That's important. One of the things uh, that Hal always used to say was, it's nice to be important, but it is important Important to to be be nice. nice. This is so true. One of the most humble people I ever met in my life, met everybody in the entertainment business, helped everybody. And I remember he had a, a, a show called International Talented Teens. And he was so proud of that. And when he needed some support from the companies, we always supported Hal. It's like, oh, Hal, we, we're supporting it. We're sending Janet Jackson there or DeBarge or whoever we'd send at the time that he needed. And, and Hal, we're sending a check. And I love his response. He was like, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> it's only $20,000. Are you sure? <laughs> well, thank you so much. <laughs> What a sweetheart. What a great guy. There's no doubt in my mind that Hal Jackson is in heaven because he deserved to be there because he was so good to so many people while he was here. He really was. I love Hal Jackson. And he made a difference with that talented teen 
a pageant. So many young women came out of that. Yes, who, they did. Who have done very well for themselves. And he never made a penny on that. He always put his money into it. You know, he was always feeding the monster, but he just thought it was so important that he give back. And that was his way of, one of his ways of giving back. It was great. These kids would have never had that exposure opportunity and, and Hal was consistent with it. He really did a great job. I admire him so much and I miss him terribly. I do too. What do you want your legacy to be? A person of integrity, a person that was pro-artist, a person that cared about the music, the songs, a person that helped other people and did things for other people that they could never repay me. I want to say thank you, first of all, for being you, because I know you, I know your heart, that you have always come to the aid of anyone who has come to you. I remember when my mom died, you were the first person that reached out to me and said, what do you need? You need to go home now. I think I live two blocks away from A&M. You had me go to A&M, A&M and you had booked my ticket and I got to go home that next day. And it so blessed me because not only were you my friend during the good times when I was programming music, but you were my friend when I didn't have a job in the record business. You always checked in with me. What you doing? How you doing? What's happening with you? And through the years, it doesn't matter how long we go without talking, I can pick up the phone and call you, Zeus, I need you, come. And you always show up next to Gerald. You are the person who I see Christ in. I was uh, saying to uh, some people earlier that Gerald was the first person in this business that talked the talk, walked the walk, and showed me who Christ was through his day-to-day actions. And I see that in you. I've seen that in you for uh, almost 40 years. When Gerald started, maybe a month later, you were at Casablanca Records. So I am so blessed to say that I can call you my friend and so blessed to see how diligent you've been as a man, as a boss, as a father, as a husband. You have always kept your steps straight and you've always been faithful. And so I want to thank you for just being a man of God, a warrior, and someone who always extends the hand to help. And I pray that God would bless you a hundred times for every time you bless somebody in need, that you become the richest man on earth for all your giving in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus Glover. Lydia, I I didn't think he was going to end this like Jerry Maguire's movie. (laughs) You had to make me cry. I just (laughs) want to tell you, man, we should all have a Gerald Busby to our right and a Jesus Garber to our left. See, I got to do my Cuba (laughs) Gooding. Woo! (laughs) Show me the money! Yes. Thank you. Thank you. It's been an honor and a pleasure. And I hope those people that have witnessed this blog get something out of it because I wish you well. And whatever you do, don't quit.